Okay, then let's start. On behalf of Thuringia State Center of Political Education and the Max Weber Center of the University of Erfurt, I would like to welcome all of you to our online conversation with Gominda Bumbra on Weber and Du Bois. A special welcome, of course, to Gominda. Great that you will share your thoughts and knowledge with us on two of sociology's giants, the connections between them as well as their contexts and receptions. My name is Urs Lindner. I'm a philosopher at the Max Weber Center and an activist within the local initiative Decolonize Erfurt. Why this event? This year is the centenary of Max Weber's death. As is perhaps not common knowledge, Weber was born in Erfurt in 1864. When the University of Erfurt was refounded in 1994, Part of this process was the creation of a research institute that would follow the Weberian program of an interdisciplinary social science with historical depth. Today, it should be quite normal, not only to spur affirmative, but also critical perspectives on Max Weber. From a post-colonial point of view, Max Weber was a sociologist of empire. His political program was that of a modernization process from above, combining outward political and territorial expansion with inward social reform, thereby integrating the working class into the Second German Empire. As scholars in the post-colonial tradition have emphasized, this political program did not remain external to Weber's theoretical and analytical work, but found its expression in assumptions that were biologically and or culturally racist. For uncritical admirers of Weber, this diagnosis may sound iconoclastic, but it is truly not. Similar things may be said of other great German thinkers like Kant, Hegel and Marx. Diagnosing racism within their theoretical work does not mean that this theoretical work is exhausted by racism. On the contrary, it may help us develop an honest relationship to these thinkers and make a truly critical use of their concepts possible. Critically thinking about Weber from a post-colonial perspective would have justified an event on its own. It would, however, not fit perfectly within the context of today's event. This context is an exhibition in Erfurt's small synagogue on African-German resistance in the early Weimar Republic. It is about the criticism of and the disobedience with racism and colonialism. And this brings us directly to W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois did not only spend several months in Eisenach, 60 kilometers away from Erfurt, when he learned German before starting his studies of economics in Berlin in 1892. There was also a personal relationship between Weber and the most important African-American intellectual of the first half of the 20th century. Not only did the two scholars meet, but Weber admired Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk to such an extent that he tried to organize a German translation of what is today known as one of the classics of anti-racism. Obviously, the relationship to Du Bois complicates the post-colonial criticism of Weber. Emphasizing this, we are already in the middle of the central question of today's event. How does a conversation between the segregated sociologies of Weber and Du Bois enrich our understanding of the modern world and the critical practice of sociology? I am happy to introduce now Gominda Bampa. She is professor of postcolonial and decolonial studies at the University of Sussex and a fellow of the British Academy. She is the author of plenty of articles and several books, amongst them Rethinking Modernity, Postcolonialism, and the Sociological Imagination, and Connected Sociologies. She is co-editor of a volume titled Decolonizing the University. In short, 
I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce the most distinguished post-colonial scholar within the discipline of sociology. I have prepared seven questions for Gominda, which she will hopefully and in an exhaustive way <laughs> answer within the next 45 to 60 minutes. Afterwards, there will be opportunity to pose further questions to her via the chat function on YouTube. In order to do so, you have to be logged in via Google. My colleague Florian Wagner from the History Department of the University of Erfurt is so kind to moderate this chat. Before we start, one final remark on the exhibition in the small synagogue. It is not yet entirely clear whether it will be closed due to the lockdown in November. Further information will be available on Wednesday by the latest, and then you can have a look at the websites of um, either the State Center of Political Education or Decolonize Air Force. So, Gominda, my first Hello. question. Hi. My first question would be W.E.B. Du Bois was a multi talented personality. Could you give us a brief glimpse of the impressive biography of this scholar, activist, organizer, journalist, compoet? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this conversation. I'm currently writing a book with John Homeward on colonialism and modern social theory, in which we deal both with Weber and Du Bois. And so it's been interesting to sort of bring them together in the preparation for this event. Um, I'm not sure I can give you a brief account of Du Bois's life. I mean, he lived to nearly 100, and he is one of the most active and prodigious scholars that there was. But um, I'll start and, and feel free to uh, interrupt me if I'm going on for too long. I mean, first of all, Du Bois was born free. And that's an important statement to make in the context of being born in the US, where much of the US was still segregated and, uh, and, and, and with forms of de facto slavery, even though the Emancipation Pro Proclamation, which had started the process of freeing the enslaved people, had been passed about sort of uh, three or four years before he was born. So he was born free. He was born in the north in Massachusetts in a small town called Great Barrington. And much of his early life was spent in a situation which was which was not segregated, even though racism continued to sort of um, be part of the context of, of his growing up. He goes to Fisk University and Fisk University is in the south. It's a historically black institution although it was initially set up as an integrated institution. So in the period after the Civil War, a number of colleges and universities were established to try and provide an integrated education for black and white uh, Americans. But white Americans largely refused to attend these institutions, so they became de facto black institutions. He did a classical liberal arts degree. He studied the, the classics, German, and other languages as well, Greek and, and so on. And then he decides to start a PhD. He goes to Harvard. He's accepted into Harvard. He has to redo his BA because they won't accept a BA from a historically black institution. And then he starts his PhD. During this time, he spends two years in, in Germany, about which we'll talk about more later, I'm sure and then returns to uh, submit his PhD and start in his career as a sociologist. Again, despite being one of the most, um, you know, already as, at a very young age, he seemed to be incredibly uh, a good scholar, but is only able to apply for jobs within what are seen as historically black institutions. So his first job is at Wilberforce College, in the South, it's a professor of classics. And from there, he does get a one year research appointment at the University of Pennsylvania, which is a historically white institution, but where he's not allowed to teach white students. So it's only a research position, but this is the context of him going on to Philadelphia Negro, which is one of the first uh, sociological texts to come out of the US. After that, he gets appointed at Atlanta University, and he stays there for about 
uh, 10 years or so, and he directs the Atlanta Sociological Laboratory, which many scholars, Earl Wright, uh, Alden Morris, amongst others, have called the first school of sociology to have existed in the US. He leaves that in 1910 to go and work for the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He's one of the co-founders of this organization and one of the very few African-Americans who's on the board. I think initially he's the only one. And he works there for about 25 years. So this is then the political phase of his career. Um, he's very active. He's editor of Crisis, which is the monthly magazine produced by the NAACP. And he's, you know, he's he's active politically in all the issues around uh, racial inequality, segregation that, that mark this period. He's also internationally politically active. He attends the Universal Races Congress, which is held in London in 1911. He's a regular attender of the Pan-African Congresses that are happening mostly within Europe. And he is he's just involved in these sorts of issues. Um, then he falls out with the NAACP over issues of segregation and particular interpretations of how and what segregation means. And he goes back to being professor of sociology at, at Atlanta University. During this period, he publishes Black Reconstruction, which I think is his, his magnum opus. But he only stays there for about 10 years before he moves back to the NAACP, this time with a more explicit international commitment. He's a delegate to the new United Nations that's just been established in 1945 and is involved in presenting a petition to the UN addressing the plight of African Americans and, and so on. However, in the 50s, this is the period of McCarthyite repression in the US, and there's he's he's targeted explicitly as uh, under the claim of being a, a, a German, um, sorry, a, a member of the Communist Party, which he never is. But eventually he decides that he doesn't wish to stay in the US anymore. Kwame Nkrumah offers him a position in Ghana to fulfill his life stream, which was to write an encyclopedia of African American people. And he takes him up on that. Uh, offer and so he travels to Ghana and on the day that he leaves the US on that day he joins the American Communist Party and says you know I've never been a member of the Communist Party but today I'm going to join and then he leaves the US and then he lives out the rest of his life in Ghana so I don't know if that's brief in German terms or yes that's so that's wonderful and a perfect overview um over this this um multi-layered um, life as a scholar, as a political activist. And of course, he was he, he had a poet style of writing. So thank you very much. So this brings me to my um, next question. And now we um, plunge in more specifically to sociology. Weber is usually considered together with Durkheim and perhaps, perhaps not, um, Marx, a founder of sociology. He is well known for his Protestant ethics and his argument about occidental rationalization. So this is something we, um, at least students of sociology in Germany know, but what is not so well known, and this is the question I have to you, is what is Du Bois's distinctive contribution to sociology? Why should we consider him a founder of the discipline as well? So I think, you know, before answering that question directly, it's important to note the fact that Du Bois lives in the US, which is a segregated society, and he works in US institutions, which are themselves segregated. So you have historically black institutions and historically white institutions. And even though all scholars who work in historically black institutions have to know and engage with the work of their white counterparts, very few white sociologists or academics more broadly systematically engage with the work of Du Bois. So despite the prolific scholarship of Du Bois and the, the, the innovative, the rigorous, the intellectually sound arguments that he presents, 
there is very little engagement at the time by white sociologists of his work. And so in a way, his ideas develop in relation to white sociology because he can't not read what other people are writing. But in terms of the tradition that develops around Du Bois, it's carried very strongly by uh, subsequent African-American scholars. So people like E. Franklin Fraser, Oliver Cromwell Cox and others, and they may not agree with him and they often disagree with him, but they engage with his work. And so I think it's important when thinking about the legacy of Du Bois's work to think about the fact that he worked in the context of a segregated institutional setting of the university, that the university system itself segregated and then what implications that would have um, for his work itself. I want to point to four, um, is, sorry, is that noise coming from me or? Is I it think it was mine, sorry. Is the sound okay? Okay. Yes. Um, I want to point to four of his key texts, which uh, I think are highly significant in terms of thinking about his contribution to sociology. So first of all, you have the Philadelphia Negro. This is the book that comes out of the research project that he undertakes for the University of Pennsylvania in the 1890s. It's published in 1899. It's a survey and ethnographic study of African-Americans living in the seventh ward in Philadelphia. It's one of the first surveys and ethnographic studies that's undertaken for sociological purposes as opposed to for policy purposes. So he and, and Du Bois does much of the legwork himself, going, knocking on doors, talking to people and collecting this data. And what he's wanting to do in a way is contest the idea that African-Americans simply exist in a condition of poverty that's common across the entire group. He wants to address the stratification between groups and discuss their conditions as various and multiple whilst at the same time acknowledging the fact that slavery and segregation are central to the experiences that they have. And as Elijah Anderson has pointed out, one of the key aims of Du Bois in doing this study was really to inform the powerful people of the city about the plight of African Americans so that they could intervene in those social conditions in order to ameliorate them and address them more fundamentally. Then there's the souls of black folk, which you mentioned. It's, it's the text that I think often people associate with Du Bois and it's the one text that people read more than the others. It's short, it's, um, it has short essays in them. The essays are poetic, they're very elusive, they're, they're cultural and partly what Du Bois, I is, and, and what other colleagues have argued that he's doing in this particular book is to present African-American culture alongside what he sees as European culture and the culture of European descended Americans and to put these cultural formations together in a way that sees them as equal on the page and therefore provides the possibility for others to begin thinking about African Americans as cultural agents in a particular sort of way. It's also got some more prosaic essays in which he talks about the Freedmen's Bureau and his disagreements with Booker T. Washington, but it's a very strong sort of clarion call for being seen to be both African American and being a citizen and for not having his African-Americanness negate the citizenship or without, I guess more strongly that he doesn't feel that he should have to give up being African-American in order to become a citizen. He wishes to assert his right to be both an African-American and a citizen of the US. And this is quite powerfully captured in many of those essays. His, the third book I would suggest is his magnum opus, Black Reconstruction. He writes this, or it's published in the 1930s. He starts writing it in the early 1910s. And the argument that he makes within this book is really that 
the dominant interpretation of the period of Reconstruction, which is the period after the Civil War, when African Americans did have the vote and were allowed to participate in the political system, albeit for 10, 20 years until there was a backlash by white Southern Democrats who then reinstated Jim Crow laws and so on, that that period of Reconstruction within the dominant historiography is presented as a period of failure, is presented as a period when the institutions of the South were too rapidly dismantled, suffrage was given too quickly to African Americans, and it just led to chaos and, and uh, a problematic situation. Du Bois argued against this view, and he drew upon all the resources at his disposal to point to the fact that during this period, African Americans participated in the democratic remaking of America, which was so effective that the many of the changes that they brought into place remained in place even after they, as African Americans, were disenfranchised for a second time under Jim Crow laws. So the constitutions that were worked out in many of the southern states were worked out together between African Americans and white Americans. But after the disenfranchisement of African Americans, the social policies that they had established continued to work for the benefit of poor white Americans subsequently. And so it, it was an extraordinary essay initially, and it's so important. It was published in the American Historical Review, which is the preeminent journal of the American Historical Association and so on. And yet not a single white historian engaged with his argument for probably 30, 40 years, 50 years even. You know, that it was just, there was just silence from the white establishment towards the arguments he was making. Not being deterred by this, he, in the 30s, starts to work on tr transforming the article into a book. And the book is a very significant contribution to historical sociology. It's an attempt to rewrite the history of Reconstruction from the perspective of the emancipated slave. So this is the character that Du Bois puts at the center of this, um, this piece of scholarship. And what he does is seek to reinterpret the claims that had previously been made about Reconstruction from the position of the emancipated slave. And he also looks at these issues in broader context. So he looks at what happens in each of the southern states. He looks at the relationship between black and white workers. And the work is really, um, his, one of his key claims really is that we have to understand this period of emancipation in terms of the agency of those who emancipated themselves by simply walking off the plantations, by withdrawing their labour from the slave system under which they had previously lived, they withdrew their labour, they walked off the plantation, and that he calls a general strike. And he says that we should understand this event in a similar way that we understand the French Revolution or the Reformation, that this is a key moment in the making of the modern world. It's not been recognized for what it is. And if we were to recognize it, we would understand that both the process of enslavement that preceded it and the agency of African Americans as they emancipate themselves from the system should be understood as world historical events and provide us with a way of rethinking history. The fourth book I want to mention is much less uh, read or, or recognized. It's a book that's published in 1945 called Color and Democracy. And here, because Du Bois, you know, I mean, like I said, he lives to be a hundred. He develops his ideas over time and he takes on board new ideas and then reinterprets his own previous thinking in light of the new ideas that he's coming to, to explicate. And in Colour and Democracy, one of the things that's sort of central to that book is the way in which that whilst in Souls of Black Folk, he said that the key problem facing the 20th century was the problem of the colour line. 
By 1945, he sees the key problem facing humanity, the problem of colonialism. And he argues quite strongly that if colonialism isn't abolished, then this is going to be something that the world is going to have to deal with. And it's it's truly problematic. So in this book, what he does really is deal with these broader histories of colonization, the processes of extraction, which are central to colonization. And he's incredibly perceptive of how demands that are being made by the working class within Europe, particularly. So, you know, it's 1945, you've got discussions around the beginnings of welfare state uh, organization in, in many countries within Europe and an organized working class that is demanding shorter working days, higher pay and more benefits. And Du Bois argues that the, the strength of the working class in European countries will force concessions from their governments. But given that their governments are largely imperial governments, who will end up paying for these concessions? It will be the proletariat in the colonized countries, such that the welfare states of Europe he points to are being funded and the wealth from the colonies is being used to um, meet the demands of the organized working class within, within Europe. And so in a way, what Du Bois does within this book, and I think it's an incredibly important uh, and class, unless you understand it in its colonial context, and that's colonial that would be both inclusive of the colonizing state as well as the colonized state. And so he puts forth a very strong argument where I think in his early work, he saw race in the US as the starting point for his analysis. Whereas by the 1940s, he sees the broader colonial system as the starting point for understanding race in America. Yes, thank you very much for this impressive summary. So if, if, if we want to break it down, it would be first, uh, let's say, a, a multi-methods um, approach to urban sociology. Second, it would be, a, it would be an egalitarian um, account within what we may perhaps call cultural sociology today, giving voices giving voice to um, to African Americans. The third would be a historical sociology of the reconstruction era in the US. And the fourth would be a materialist sociology of colonialism. So yes. this is very impressive. Thank you for, for giving us this wonderful summary. So um, you mentioned already his um, Yes, the German connection of uh, Du Bois. So let's talk a bit about Du Bois' encounter with Germany and, of course, with Weber, which is the topic of today's um, uh, conversation. We do not only want to talk about Du Bois, but about both uh, scholars in tandem. So Du Bois was in Germany as a student from 1892 to 1894, where he probably attended some lectures of Weber or some the same events that Weber um, where Weber was, but without getting into personal contact with him. The two scholars met when, when Weber was in the US in 1904, and there was an exchange of letters afterwards between them. In 1906, Du Bois published an article in Weber's archive um, for social science and, and social policy, Archiv für Sozialwissenschaft und Sozialpolitik, which was the, something like the, the, the yearbook of the, um, of the um, Verein für Sozialpolitik. So could you elaborate a bit on um, these connections? Um, what would be the what would be the status of 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 um, Du Bois's contribution to the archive to Weber's archive within the narrative you have unfolded? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the first things to note 
is that uh, the universities in the US were very much modeled on the Humboldt system. So there was a strong connection to Germany from within the US university system. And a number of Americans would come to Germany for a couple of years of study before returning. And so in that sense, I guess Du Bois is not uh, unique or different from many scholars in the sense of wishing to spend a period of study in Germany, because that's what serious scholars, I guess, particularly in the social sciences, we're doing Parsons, for example, spends years there. You know, any number of his contemporaries would have spent time in Germany. He's very, I mean, and, and I'm drawing here particularly on the work from recent uh, considerations of, of Du Bois. So people like Alden Morris, um, Robert Vitalis, and obviously the, the two volume Pulitzer Prize winning biography by David Levering Lewis, which is truly a wonderful read. So if you want to know yet more of the details of Du Bois's life, I can strongly recommend uh, that biography of him. And what gets presented is that, you know, Du Bois is very keen on his time in Germany. He's very keen to be developing the ideas that he is. He's working towards a, a PhD dissertation in Germany, which is on the um, on agriculture in, sub, in the southern US. But because of a lack of funding, he can't meet the residency requirements in Berlin in order to be able to submit his dissertation, even though it's all written and it's completed. And so then he has to go back to Harvard. And there he submits a different dissertation on the uh, suppression of the slave trade to the US. So whilst he's in Germany, he's working on issues of race and agriculture in the context of economics. And what I find interesting is that this is in the years just prior to Weber's Freiburg address, in which he talks explicitly about questions of race and agriculture when he's talking about the, uh, the the problems in inverted commas posed by Polish uh, peasants who live within areas that Germany seeks to exert its sovereignty over and the contestations that he's addressing between Polish peasants and German workers and including Jewish uh, workers and peasants as well in that sort of context. So this seems to be something that many scholars are engaged in at the time. It's not clear that Weber and Du Bois met whilst he was in Germany, although it's certainly true that Weber looks him up when he um, goes to, to, to the US with his wife Marianne for a four month visit. And there Weber himself presents a paper on agriculture and, and race and you know, then on his journeys around, he tries to meet with Booker T. Washington, who's another key African-American figure at the time. I don't think he gets to meet him on that visit, but he does meet with Du Bois, is um, impressed by him and asks him to contribute a, an essay to the archive. One of the things also to be aware of, I think, is that during this period, the Verein of which this archive is the key publication, is also in extensive discussions with Booker T. Washington, who, you know, as I mentioned, is the other key African-American intellectual of his time. He differs from Du Bois quite extensively in, you know, he runs the Tuskegee Institute. This is funded by wealthy philanthropists, white philanthropists, Andrew Carnegie being one of them. And what Washington, argues is a need to have an accommodation between white Americans and African Americans and, and so on. But why the Verein is interested in Booker T. Washington is because they want him to advise them on how they can get Africans in their African colonies, particularly in Togoland, to submit to the work regimes that African Americans are being submitted to in the US. So the broader political context in Germany at the time in relation to colonies that it's beginning to establish is instead of having plantations in the US and then you transport Africans from Africa to work in these plantations elsewhere, why not simply establish plantations in Africa and get Africans to work in those plantations for you there, except that they encounter problems in managing that regime because the Africans who don't wish to be coerced to work in, plant in German plantations on their own land 
just choose to leave the area and go to other places. And so they enlist the help of Booker T. Washington to advise them on this. So at the same time as the archive is publishing one essay by Du Bois, it also has a lot of contributions in relation to this other uh, topic. Okay, if I if I remember correctly, um, Weber was when he was in the U.S. He he visited Tuskegee, but Booker T. Washington was not there, so he was only um, became familiar with with uh, with how this institute worked with Booker T. Washington's um, wife, but not with him um, personally. So then let's come to my fourth quest question. Um, Du Bois experienced his stay in Germany as kind of liberation from racism. This is, uh, he mentioned this several times. Can we infer from this that Germany at the beginning of the 1890s was less racist than Jim Crow America? Or is it a question of the specific intellectual milieu that Du Bois encountered? Or is it simply the fact that at this time in Germany, anti-Slavic racism and anti-Semitism were dominant in comparison to anti-Black racism? Or the final option, should we treat Du Bois's experience as merely subjective? So which option would you prefer? I think we have to understand that the world at the time was a world that was organized through colonialism, forms mm. of imperialism, and deep segregation and enslavement and coerced labor in a variety of forms. So, and, and that these were differently manifest in different places around the world. And I think it's perhaps no surprise to imagine that Du Bois, who having grown up in in the relatively liberal context of northern Massachusetts, then having traveled south of the Mason-Dixie line to study at Fisk, and then going to the elite and also hierarchically stratified sort of institutions of Harvard, when on coming to Germany, would potentially feel a sense of liberation because there he is seen as an American as well as an African-American. So his color doesn't define the entirety of who he is. And any number of African-Americans on coming to Europe have often talked about the liberation that they have felt personally in being in these sorts of spaces. So James Baldwin, perhaps most famously, lives in Paris for a number of years in the mid 20th century and talks about the freedom that is provided to him in that context. But the situation of people of African descent who've been born and brought up in France and other places is very different from the experience of those who come who are also American, as well as being, you know, and I think it works also the other way. I have a number of colleagues who are uh, Afro-Caribbean who've gone from Britain to America and talk about a space in America that they don't have in Britain because in America they're understood as British as well as Black. And so that that provides a different sort of orientation. So I think partly it's subjective in the sense that when you move, you are seen differently than you are seen in the place that you're from. But it's also that these contexts, people are able to find spaces to thrive despite however terrible situations are, or they're often able to find those spaces. And from Du Bois's own account, he certainly found that space when he came to Berlin. He found an intellectual milieu. He found, uh, you know, by all accounts, he dressed as a dandy. So he was able to sort of express himself in, in ways that he felt uh, most comfortable. And this was a time that he always looked back on in with, with good good thoughts, as it were. But I wouldn't want to take from his experience to then make any comment about the general social structural nature of either society, because as you said yourself, it's not as if there weren't intersecting forms of racialized hierarchy that were creating the context, particularly for people of Polish descent or Jews within this, the, the new state, the new German state that was being established that would have had its own sort of um, 
consequences for those of that region. Mm -hmm. So my next question would be in decolonizing Weber, Andrew Zimmerman has criticized Weber for being racist. His focus is twofold. First, Zimmerman argues that religion in Weber is a proxy of race, which sheds another critical light on Weber's argument about the West and the rest. This is what I called cultural racism in my introduction. Um, the cultural superiority of Western civilization due to social configurations unique to the West. Second, according to Zimmerman, Weber displayed a considerable amount of anti-slavic racism, both of the biological and cultural kind when analyzing um, East Albion agrarian um, relations in the early 1890s, you mentioned already his inauguration address in Freiburg. For example, he talked about Poles as an inferior race. Um, um, and he, 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 he warned against um, their tide, a big tide of them um, coming with immigration. So th there, there, there are typical racist concerns in Weber at this time and but if we follow Alden Morris's book that you have mentioned um, on Du Bois, The Scholar Denied, Weber uh, may have dropped some of his early racism due to his encounter with Du Bois, for example. He started an argument with the racist eugenicist Alfred Plötz on the concept of race at the first Congress of German Sociologists in 1910. And he was willing to learn from a black scholar like Du Bois to an extent the Chicago schools, school was never inclined to do. So how would, should we balance the arguments of Zimmerman and Morris when critically looking at Weber? Can Du Bois via Morris help us see Weber in a more positive light? Okay, I'll answer that question in three parts. So firstly, I think that there is no evidence of Weber learning from Du Bois, no matter what Alden Morris says. And I'll come back to that uh, shortly. I think the work that Andrew Zimmerman has done and Man Manuela Buechka also has a recent article on this, where she talks about the fact that religion is for Weber a proxy for race. And so in a sense, even though Weber doesn't believe in a sort of biological or genetic understanding of race. He does put forward very strongly a cultural understanding of race, which in a way actually aligns him quite nicely with the Chicago School, who also operate with a cultural understanding of race in order to explain the hierarchies and inequalities that others um, uh, exhibit. And so his Weber's argument with Plutz isn't inconsistent with his earlier arguments, because in a sense, even if the biological takes a secondary place, the cultural replaces it, and the cultural continues to function in very much the same sort of way. Now, there, there is an argument that you could make that Alden Morris in his book, sort of in a way rehabilitates a little bit Weber, and uh, points to the learning that Weber may well have done from Du Bois. I don't think there's any evidence for that. And I think what Morris is doing is something that's a little bit different. Because if you remember one of the things that I was saying at the very beginning, that Du Bois operates in a segregated society and in a segregated academy. And one of the consequences of that segregation is that he's not part of the sociological canon. And in the context of arguments that have been made more recently about the need to have Du Bois in the canon, some scholars have argued that how can you bring Du Bois into the canon when people didn't think that he merited being in the canon earlier, and therefore he's not part of the conversations that are part of what constitutes the sociological canon. So I think partly, in, which I think is incorrect and can be dismantled in a number of ways. And one of the ways in which Alden Morris, I think, is seeking to dismantle that argument is pointing to this initial connection between Du Bois and Weber and seeking to open a space for the reintegration of Du Bois into the canon via his conversation with Weber. I have no issue with that, 
but I don't think that necessarily mitigates the assessment made by people like Andrew Zimmerman and Manuela Bocca about Weber otherwise. And this aspect, you know, the last part of, of your question is sort of saying, you know, can it help us see Weber in a more positive light? And I would ask the question, you know, why do we need to see Weber in a positive <laughs> light? I would, uh, I would sort of maybe sort of say back to you that the light of the great cultural problem has moved on. And in moving on, it shines a light on colonialism as race, as the issues that are central to, to Du Bois's work and not to Weber. So who now reads Weber and for what purpose? Okay, <laughs> thank you for this uh, reply. Um, so uh, Morris's account um, of the encounter of uh, Weber and Du Bois is uh, highly uh, celebratory, as you mentioned already. One may, however, also focus um, critically on some commonalities between the two scholars. According to Adolf Reed's reconstruction, the political thought of Du Bois was highly elitist. Weber, in turn, may be considered as the thinker of Germany's um, passive revolution, to um, use the term of Gramsci, from above. Is elitism and the belief in a strictly meritocratic society a shared background assumption of Du Bois and Weber? Do we encounter here one of the limits of their thinking? So again, I would put across the position that I think that I don't think that Weber and Du Bois are similar on this topic at mm -hmm. all. And I think that the talented tenth is something that um, I, well, I would interpret it in a different way. So the way in which I see Du Bois's work is that partly what he's seeking to do, and we see it from very early on in the Philadelphia Negro, is that he's seeking to address the African-American community across its social stratifications. So the common perception of white sociologists to African-Americans across this period has effectively been that they're poor and they're poor because they're African-American and you know, that, that they live the way that they do because that's part of their cultural um, context. And Du Bois is wanting to sort of make the point that actually there is, that the community is not uniform. Poverty, whilst it may be a dominant aspect of many members of the community, the poverty is a consequence of two centuries of enslavement and segregation, and that despite these broader social and political contexts, some African Americans have nonetheless made, done more for themselves in that context. And so why shouldn't one celebrate the achievements of those who have managed to achieve these um, things despite all the, the negative conditions. And so it's much less a sort of valorization and promotion of an elite than a recognition that there is also an elite within this community. So I think that, you know, so there's, there's that aspect of it. And then the other distinction that I think I would make is that Du Bois is one of the first to argue strongly for the social rights of citizenship not just for civil and political rights, but a need to understand the, the, that it's not possible to have equality or emancipation, or it's not possible to have political emancipation without having social emancipation, and that social emancipation requires an address of inequality, socioeconomic inequality, as the basis from which one sort of takes this forward. And he's quite but I think this is possibly implicit in his work earlier on, and it certainly becomes much more explicit towards the end of his career when he sees that class, but class has, as I was saying before, has to be understood as emerging out of the colonial context. So whilst there was a brief period in which he argued in the context of the US that you know, black and white workers ought to unite because class was the key issue in those terms, one of the things that very quickly became apparent was that white workers were not prepared to give up uh, what you know, he presents as their wages of whiteness in order to make common cause with black workers. They would rather 
be keep themselves separate. And in that context, Du Bois thought it was unfair to ask black workers to continually accommodate themselves and express solidarity with white workers when white workers refused to do it. And that they should instead recognize that their condition is a colonial condition and that this colonial condition is an international condition and look to making those international links in order to think about how class and race could be transformed, but that it would have to be transformed through the abolition of colonialism, not through a focus on class or race in, in their own terms. And so that's not something that I think Weber ever. Okay, so, so instead of um, emphasizing the commonalities between Weber and Du Bois in, on this um, point, you would rather read Du Bois as um, critically in an anti-racist and anti-colonial way, expanding some arguments of Marx. Um, I think Du Bois does come to take up you know, does engage with Marx much more to, in his later works, but he also, he engages with Marx as providing ideas and impetus for his own thinking, but the argument that he develops for the abolition of colonialism as the key factor in the liberation of African Americans, as well as other minorities, and actually the majority population in the world, I think makes him more aligned to the tradition of people like Dada Bhai Naroji, who's arguing against the British Empire in the context of India, and then M.A. Cezaire and others. So I would put him in the line of post-colonial thinkers. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a wonderful um, transfer to my last question. Um, du Bois in um, the forethought, he calls it forethought of uh, souls of black folk, famously argued that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Um, you already mentioned that he, uh, in, in the 1930s, he included colonialism um, stronger into his um, thinking about um, racism and the color line. So um, would, you, would you see this as a... Um, that that he skipped this idea of the color line, or did he rather expand on? Did, did he make it? Did he put it on a global level, so to speak? Um, and if he did, and if we would follow him, um, would the color line still the prob be the problem of the twenty first century? I mean, it's interesting, and I don't know how much other scholars of Du Bois would agree with me on this, but the way in which I read Du Bois is that he starts explicitly in Souls of Black Folk by identifying the problem of the 20th century as the problem of the color line. And he is explicitly committed to an understanding of the position of African Americans in the US in the context of race. And race is the defining um, paradigm, if you like, for the ways in which he seeks to understand both why it is that they're in the position that they are and how this can be overcome. By towards the middle of the 20th century, I think he's, you know, and, and this movement towards an internationalist position doesn't just suddenly happen in the 1940s, it's there at the beginning as well. So, for example, when he is part of setting up the NAACP, one of the reason they call it the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and not of African Americans is because with the phrase colored people, he's sort of gesturing towards the, the, the broader colonized world that he wishes this organization also to be taking into consideration. So at that time, he is quite positive about the work of people like Mahatma Gandhi and others who are working towards the, you know, the, the decolonization of India. And he sees that there is common cause to be made. This becomes to be developed much more explicitly through the 30s and 40s, such that by the time his book Colour and Democracy is published, he does explicitly say that whereas previously he had thought that the problem of the colour line was the key problem, he now thinks that it's the problem of colonization and that it's not until we have the abolition of colonialism 
that the problems that previously he had identified as internal to the US as somehow structured by its national character, he now understands as being structured by the US's colonial character, both in terms of it being a settler colony, even though he doesn't say much about the fate of indigenous people, but also in terms of it being part of the colonial system that has uh, oppressed at least a quarter, if not a half of the world's population. And until that is overturned and transformed, then the other problems are not going to be addressed. Okay, thank you very much. And this was a, I think, a wonderful conversation for me, very insightful. Thank you so much for um, your answers. So now we have the chat function, which is open for questions. Mm -hmm. We already have a first question um, in the chat and two questions also reached me um, via email. So I think um, perhaps we, we can put two of the questions um, together, one question in the chat is, can, can we learn from Black Reconstruction towards building an eco-abolitionism to bring an end to racial and species um, global capitalism before the planet enters a hothouse Earth climate tra trajectory in um, 2029? 20, so this is um, much about... Um, um, yes, uh, um, environmental racism and what we can learn if we take Du Bois's account of the Reconstruction era seriously. I would put it together with a question um, that reached me via email, and the question would be very similar. Within attempts of analyzing the debit, and it would be to um, in respect to, to COVID-19. So within attempts of analyzing the devastating effect of COVID-19 on African Americans, a number of scholars, epidemiologists, and others have been quoting Du Bois's The Philadelphia Negro, where he not only describes the health problems of poor African Americans living in the city, but also said that there were few other cases in the history of civilized people where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. So two questions. How do, do you think is Du Bois' work helping us in understanding the current pandemic? And how does his analysis of the politics of health change um, over the years? So it would be to the double to two of our the many crises we are currently going through, one in respect to the climate crisis, the other in respect to the pandemic. Okay, thank you for that. I think, I mean, in terms of the pandemic first, there is a strong correlation from what I understand about what's happening in the US, and it seems very similar to what's happening in Britain as well, where the majority of people who are both catching COVID-19 and then uh, suffering the worst effects of it are from ethnic minority backgrounds, African-American in the US, but also Hispanic and others, and Black British, but also people of Bangladeshi origin and others within Britain. And this is correlated to the conditions of inequality within which these populations live. One of the ways in which people have sought to present the argument it's been to say that it's about race. It's because they're African American or because they're uh, Afro Caribbean or because they're Bangladeshi British, that's why they've got more propensity towards catching COVID. It's something genetic or it's got to do with underlying health conditions and so on. The argument that scholars who work on this have, have set, put forward is that there is no genetic basis to this it's correlated to conditions of deprivation and inequality. It's correlated to the jobs that people do because many of the uh, front-facing jobs, the service sector jobs, if you think about bus drivers, tram drivers, cleaners, 
as, and so as well as those who are working within the NHS in the British context and so on, are from these backgrounds. So they're more likely to be exposed to the virus because they're doing the jobs that put them in a position where this likelihood is vastly increased. Then if they do get the virus, they're likely to suffer worse consequences because they're often in situations which again are either deprived or uh, there are various markers of inequality that, that mark them. And so in that sense, I think this was something that, you know, as you were stating in Du Bois's work on the Philadelphia Negro, he points quite clearly to the worst health outcomes of those people who live in the most deprived and most unequal of situations. That these things doesn't mean that because they're African American, this is happening. It's because we live in a society where race organizes opportunities and possibilities such that it puts some people into conditions of deprivation, that if that deprivation is then causally related to outcomes associated with this particular disease, then it's not about race, it's about racism and the way in which racism is structuring our societies in order to uh, present these worse outcomes. The other thing that I would want to just mention here, I mean, particularly in the British context, one of the things that I, I had noticed quite clearly in the first wave of COVID that we had was that a lot of the initial deaths were of people from a minority ethnic background and they were being displayed on the TV and newspapers and so on. And it felt like, and, and these were people, they were doctors, they were bus drivers, they were cleaners, they were corner shop uh, owners, they were, um, you know, all the people working in service sector jobs and, and the health service and so on. And there was a disproportionate, I think the first 10 doctors to die in Britain were of a minority ethnic background. And so it was quite a visible and dramatic presentation of who was dying and that they were dying in service of the community. It wasn't just, you know, these, and, and so that, given that we've, as you may know, have been going through this thing called Brexit for the last four years, where Brexit has been organized around uh, narrowing our understanding of who we are, it felt like there was a small moment in which suddenly there was the possibility of a more expansive understanding of who we are and what that means for the political project of Britain. And one can only hope that that similar sort of opening in the context of the US, where it's quite clear that those who are at risk of COVID are those who are in poor areas, but also older people and so on. And people, you know, so we'll have to see in a couple of days what consequence that has, if any, on the outcome of the current political event happening on that side of the, the pond. Okay. Oh, then the issue about the environment. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I mean, from what I've read, Du Bois doesn't explicitly talk about the environment, but what is it that we could take from his work in order to think about these issues? I think one of the issues is points to the connected context within which we live and how those who contribute the least to climate change are the ones who likely to suffer the most from climate change. So if we think again of, of the places where poorer communities live, they often live in areas which are most at risk of flooding, of the, the dramatic events associated with hurricanes and typhoons and so on. We saw that in New Orleans and the US. We see that in Bangladesh and other places in the East. And so there's a sense of what would a just orientation to addressing climate change look like? it would be less about thinking about what they need to do and thinking about what we need to do in order that they don't suffer the consequences of the lifestyles we live. And to recognise those connections, I think, would be something that we could take quite explicitly from Du Bois's work. Thank you.
So um, I would strongly encourage um, you who are watching this um, conversation, if you have any questions, please um, post them. Um, another question that reached me via email um, is um, concerns the relationship um, between Du Bois and the Chicago school. You mentioned that. Uh, could you expand a bit on this? Um, particularly with respect to race, um, maybe also with respect to the second Chicago school. So what was the particular difference um, in the um, approach of um, accounting for race? Was it, could one say, okay, on the one hand in, in Du Bois it was a social account and the Chicago account, uh, school, it was a um, cultural account. What about the um, African American sociologies, uh, sociologists like um, Oliver Cox, who were, were um, at least to a certain extent influenced by the Chicago school? What about the entire, this entire phenomenon of the caste school of race? So could you expand a bit on this? Um, well, I think one of the key differences between Du Bois and other sociologists working at the time was really where they located inequality and in what they located inequality. So whilst initially within white sociology in the US, there was a strong sense that inequality emerges as a consequence of something biological, that shifts by the sort of 50s and 60s into being something that's understood as cultural. But in neither of those, whether it's biological or cultural, neither of them locate inequality to be a consequence of the socio-historic conditions within which African-Americans have been placed. And so Du Bois is one of the key figures who locates that inequality explicitly in the 200 years of enslavement and then segregation, and says that if that inequality is to be addressed, it can only be addressed by making reparation, socioeconomic reparation, for that uh, previous inequality. That is the context then of thinking about issues of emancipation. So whereas within sort of many uh, either European descended sociologists or others, there's a sense that emancipation is simply the opposition to enslavement. For Du Bois, emancipation had to be opposed to enslavement, but it also required socioeconomic equality in order for people to be able to develop their full capacities as, as human beings. And so I think their Du Bois is quite distinct from the others. Why? I mean, there, there's also work that has been done that points to the way in which, because Robert Park was initially a secretary of Booker T. Washington, and he then goes on to be seen to be one of the key figures of the Chicago School, what he does often whenever Du Bois is invited to speak somewhere at a public event, he organises there for there to be somebody who would be there to oppose Du Bois and to sort of, you know, criticise him and, and so on. And so there's this quite active undermining of the arguments that Du Bois is putting forward by other members. So it's not just, so it's not just that the academy is segregated, but there is also an attempt explicitly to undermine Du Bois's arguments. And one has to wonder of what that's about and what, you know, why were they so afraid of Du Bois's arguments such that despite a segregated academy, they still had to seek to diminish the value of what he was saying and what he was putting forward. And one of the things that I find just so remarkable about him is that for nearly a hundred years, he just carried on. He never gave up. He tried everything. He worked in academia, in politics, in newspapers. He wrote regular articles for both the, the magazine that he edited, The Crisis, but also for any other magazine that would take a piece by him. He was politically active. He was just, and in spite of everything, 
he carried on. And I think, you know, that ultimately that we should learn from Du Bois. It really is that, that no matter how terrible the situation might seem at any point, you just keep carrying on. If you believe that what you are doing is correct, you carry on. Okay, so Du Bois is also kind of role model how to encounter um, academic exclusion and uh, marginalization. So another question is within the um, chat, YouTube chat, how should we address the problem of indigenous knowledge and people? Should we take a re reconquista method developed in, I don't understand, I'm not sure whether I understand it correctly, reconquista method developed in decolonization is not a metaphor. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, well, I think, I mean, I think the article decolonization is not a metaphor is a brilliant article. I think that it's key insight that when we talk about decolonizing, we should locate that verb in a practical aspect of material decolonization. And, you know, we can't decolonize Weber, we can't decolonize the curriculum, even as those terms have become increasingly popular. There's, the popularity points to something that isn't possible. What we need to do is work on how we can make the curriculum better. We need to work on how we can understand Weber critically and engage with his arguments in the context, both of which he wrote them and thinking about what use they might be for us in the present, being aware of the context that produces those particular sorts of ideas and, and so on. And so whilst I agree with the, the argument that's presented in decolonization is not a metaphor, I would disagree with the fact that decolonization is only about the restitution of the land of indigenous peoples, because colonization was a multi-pronged process. It involved both settler colonization, which involved the dispossession and elimination of indigenous peoples, and it also involved processes of extraction from around the world, which left populations impoverished, but also um, contributed to their deaths through famine and other sorts of intensive labor processes as well. And so I think we need to be aware of how we use language and think about what we mean when we talk about decolonizing, and therefore to think about the fact that how we use that term in a scholarly context has to also be rooted in a particular sort of politics, and that's a politics of the world within which we live. Thank you. So another question that reached me um, by email, what about Du Bois and gender? Um, could you expand on this a bit? Or is this, yes? I've not I, I've not read or researched on that particular topic. Um, yes, I don't know what I would say. Is there the, is there any research on on gender relations in Du Bois? What Du Bois's account of gender accounts of gender regimes are? How so? If if we if we look at him from from current. Um, let's say intersectional uh, um, approaches, then of course it would be interesting. What uh, does he? Of course, he has to say something about the, the 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 about family relations and all this stuff. I mean, when he does the Philadelphia Negro, he does look explicitly at issues of gender in terms of gender as an empirical category, not as a political or normative category in the sense of, you know, there are more African-American women in particular in the city, in part because they have access to employment within the city in a way that African-American men don't. So he has um, an understanding of the different dynamics that enable it to be easier for African-American women to gain employment. 
which is not possible for African-American men. And he also talks about the consequences of that disproportionality in terms of um, the, the consequences for the establishment of family relations and what he calls, you know, conjugal uh, analysis in these terms. But from what I've read around, or what I take from Du Bois is more his analysis of the colonial, the global, the political, and the social. So I haven't read him in order to discern what he says about gender. Other colleagues may well have done. Okay, another question in the chat is, what and how should school students especially learn about Du Bois and post-colonialism in schools? Well, I think, you know, in the, so I'm based in Britain and the way in which British history is taught is often as if the only thing that constitutes British history are things that happened in Britain. And yet Britain, for much of its history, ruled over much of the world. And so it seems impossible to understand Britain in the present without understanding the fact that British history covered a quarter of the world's territory, governed over one-fifth of its population, including one and two Muslims by the 1920s. And so in that context, we can't understand British society today without locating it in its history of empire and colonialism. So the history of British colonialism is British history. And the same could be said for Europe, that the history of Europe is the history of European colonialism. And without understanding European colonialism, we're also not going to understand Europe. So in the context of Britain and Europe, which is the geographical context in which I'm located, that's what I think people should learn. In terms of Du Bois, I think that any of us who do um, study sociology or political science should be aware of the work of one of the key thinkers of the 20th century, a key thinker who was both recognized as astound, outstanding in his own time, as well as somebody who, as you read him, it's even more extraordinary that he was um, excluded from the conversation that was happening. And so given that he was excluded from the conversation, what does it mean to have a canon and to only work on the canon. And then my argument is not just that all we need to do now is include Du Bois in the canon and everything will be well. But if we are to include Du Bois, we actually have to rethink the standard concepts and categories of sociology that we had previously um, put forward when we had excluded him. Because including him has to make a difference. It can't just be, oh great, now we've got Du Bois, let's carry on as normal. No, there has to be a transformation of the discipline as a consequence. So if I understand you correctly, the plea would be to rewrite national histories from the perspective of empire and have a look how the national emerges within mm -hmm. imperial. And perhaps this is the interesting point if you um, look at colonialism from a German perspective, from an from a trans-imperial um, context, because um, Germany at this time didn't, or before 1884, did not have a um, colonial empire on its own, but was part, and, and Germans are, put it like this, Germans participated in the other colonial empires and there was huge interactions and connections between these empires so um you could argue that they also participated in an imperial project on the continent of europe mm -hmm. to the extent that the way in which weber talks about the need to establish the borders of the german nation have to be established against the polish populations mm -hmm. that live within its borders so his explicit practices of what zimmerman has called depolonization Mm -hmm. It's an attempt to exert an imperial understanding of the state whilst calling it a nation state. So the wish to tell national histories as imperial histories is the wish to tell proper histories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Weber would be a motivation to give up the 
what has been called the salt water theory of <laughs> colonialism. We had this um, several months ago with a, um, a conversation with Mark Telkacidis, who's very, um, very um, eager to emphasize this. So actually, um, if I, um, there are some more, um, questions um and one so my colleagues from the max weber center they prefer to send me the questions via email which is uh, i'm very happy with so one question one further would be contemporary black theorists and sociologists such as Adolf Reed Jr. and Cedric Johnson argue pretty explicitly against what they call a generic anti-racism, anti in um, brackets, um, which does not take into account the economic conditions that produce the strains of inequality associated with the more culturally understood racism. So this is what we already had. Isn't the conception of decolonization constitutively connected to economic issues and doesn't the recourse to an analysis of race colonialism stay highly abstract without this connection? Aren't the conditions of the possibility of a radical and emancipatory politics today today dependent on such a condition? So I guess um, your answer will be quite clear about this. Well, to the extent that I think that um, I'm not, how can I put it this way? I don't think reform is a dirty word. I think reform is important in order to be able to get wherever it is that we're wishing to get to. So in that sense, I think in the way in which, you know, that the, there's a need to identify the problems of the world within which we're living and to think about the ways to address those problems and in the address of those problems, hopefully move beyond those problems into a world that's different from the way in which we uh, uh, imagine it today. So I would be happy if we did that work in terms of, you know, so that the the radical ideas we have are grounded explicitly in an attempt to address the existing problems that we face. I'm not sure that answers mm -hmm. this question fully, but I'm happy to give it another go if you want to. No, no, that was was wonderful. So I think um, time is running short. We already have 84 minutes in our conversation. So there's one, there are, I would put them together, two final questions. The one is, um, were there any interactions between Malcolm X and Franz Fanon and Du Bois? Um, so this rather factual question and the other um, question is only some hints, Emé Césaire's theory of colonial boomerang effect in relation to the Nazis, World War, War II and the Holocaust. So I think the second question is opening an entire new um, terrain. So I'm not sure whether we should start start with it, perhaps give a reply to the first question. And if you want, you can say something on the second question. Okay. Um, I don't know about interactions between Fanon, Malcolm X and um, Du Bois, I'm afraid. I mean, in David Levering Lewis's biography, I didn't come across stuff. I mean, Du Bois, is part of the Pan-African Congresses. And so one would need to look at research that, that looks at his participation there and to see what, whether the links existed. Um, but I'm afraid I just, I just don't know. Um, linking in to, I mean, I think in a way, you know, that's also quite close to Du Bois's understandings or the understandings that he comes to have, because from being focused explicitly on the issues of African Americans in the US, he does come to understand that there's a correlation between what African Americans are living through together with 
what minorities, and particularly Jewish minorities in Europe, but also multicultural minorities within Europe are facing, and then what small colonized nations are facing. So he connects the issue of African Americans in the US with colonized countries and the issue of minorities, particularly Jewish people within Europe, and sees them as located within a similar sort of matrix. And so I think that he wouldn't uh, be that far away from M.A. Cazé's arguments around the ways in which we have to understand these horrors and these atrocities as emerging out of this broader colonial matrix that is consuming the world at that particular time. Okay, thank you. There's a last um, remark. There's a series of essays about the colonial boomerang effect and Nazi Germany on Verso books blog. So I don't know these essays, but perhaps they are interesting as further reading. I think my own reading of Du Bois is that he's kind of he's he's very he's very open in his what he's observing. So there, there's one one piece of him from. Um, 1944, where he says um, that what is done to the Jews is without precedent in modern history. So one can find with him an inclination to 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 see the specificities and particularities of the Holocaust. And of course, on the other hand, he's quite clear that certain certain techniques and um, practices of violence um, were first um, first developed within a colonial context and then they um, um, hit strike back to Europe with what is meant by the boomerang effect. So I would recommend, um, and some people only are inclined to see the boomerang effect. I think uh, that that further critical readings of Du Bois might um, reveal a very um, complex and differentiated position on this issue. For example, one could also read what he wrote about um, the, his um, his report on of his visit of the Warsaw ghetto, or also what he wrote in 1948 about um, the um, foundation of the state of Israel in the text, um, the case for the Jews, which is by the way very Zionist. Um, so this is, I think one can find um, there in Du Bois. Uh, a rather complex view, and perhaps this is something for further scholarship that um, we could um, yeah, develop. So I think we are now, we, we had a conversation of nearly one and a half hours, so I think um, we should not um, get too exhausted. So this was wonderful, and I would warmly like to thank you for this great conversation. So I, I have the feeling to have learned a lot and I guess the, the audience might feel the same. Thank you so much. It's been great to be part of this conversation. So thank you. And I would now stop the streaming.